look at this shark. What do you reckon? Is that a scary shark? A few yeses, a couple of noes. Most of you are not sure. And that's all right, because you probably need a bit more context to answer that question. I mean, who are you? Are you another shark? Or perhaps you're a smaller fish that eats seaweed or algae. Would that change how scary you find that shark? I'm a marine scientist that studies fear in coral reefs. And whether that shark was a scary shark or not is a very important question. Because coral reefs aren't just beautiful places to go swimming. For some fishes, they're a landscape of fear. And that's because of predators. It doesn't matter whether you're on the land or if you live in the ocean. Predators don't just eat their prey. They also create fear in their prey. And that fear comes about because prey, they don't want to be someone's meal. So when a predator's around, they have to be vigilant. Think about it from the fish's point of view. If you were heading to your local supermarket, but there was a reasonable chance that you might get picked off by a man-eating predator. <laughs> Would you be perusing the shelves for your favorite brand of pesto? No, you'd probably sneak in, you'd grab whatever you can, you'd be looking behind your shoulder, and before you know it, you're not paying attention, you've grabbed the wrong jar of pesto, and ah, it's a terrible experience. Some of you might hear about this stressful supermarket situation and think, you know what, I'm good. I actually ate a few hours ago, I was just looking for a snack to tide me over. I don't need that, it's not worth it. And these predators, they force prey to make a trade-off between being cautious and doing important things, like feeding or making more baby fishes. These seemingly small, insignificant trade-offs are actually very important. They can have big consequences, and they can affect entire ecosystems, from the very top right to the very bottom. Ah, I know. This is my favorite example of an unexpected consequence that came about from the sphere of predators. I'm going to tell you the story of Yellowstone National Park. So in Yellowstone National Park, wolves were reintroduced after being hunted to extinction. And when we reintroduced these wolves, we also reintroduced fear into their prey populations, or elk. And so elk had to make this trade-off between being vigilant against the wolves and eating their favorite food, which is aspen, a plant. And because the elk were spending less time eating aspen, this actually gave aspen populations the chance to grow and thrive. So by reintroducing wolves to the top of the food chain, we got this unexpected benefit at the bottom of the food chain. And it's very cool. So let's get back to the fish. Because how on earth do you study fear of predators in coral reefs? Sounds like a pretty abstract thing to study. And that's because we're looking at things that are really tricky to witness in nature. It's even trickier when you can't breathe underwater. So you can't just sit there and watch these trade-offs play out. But there are ways that we can get little snapshots into these trade-offs. Look at this satellite image of a coral reef. That's coral. All that green stuff is seaweed or algae. And that little sand patch around that coral, that looks like any old bare patch of sand. That's not any old bare patch of sand at all. That is a grazing halo. Now, the theory is that these halos form because of a fear of predators. See that coral bummy in the middle there? That has lots of crevices and places to hide from passing predators. So the fish don't really want to leave the safety of that coral. They're too scared to go to that delicious seaweed just outside the grazing halo. Instead, they focus their foraging to within close proximity of that coral, making that grazing halo shape. We don't have direct, experimental evidence that predators play a role in grazing halo formation. And there's two very good reasons that we don't have that knowledge yet. The first is that sharks are pretty uncooperative. I don't know if you've ever tried to train a shark before. Famously bad pets. Terrible. They never do anything we say. So they're not going to swim around and scare certain fish for me. The second problem we face is that humans are quite scary. To a fish, I'm pretty big. And if I'm breathing through noisy scuba apparatus, I'm absolutely terrifying. So even if I did set up an experiment where I was looking at interactions between sharks and fish that eat seaweed, 
I'll just completely break the experiment because I'm too scary. So when I was planning my research, I was a little bit stumped at first, I was thinking, oh gosh, how am I going to overcome these limitations? They're pretty big ones. But luckily, there's a very simple solution to both of these problems, and that is to hire some actors. So, let me introduce you to my cast. <laughs> this is my actor. This is my black tip reef shark actor. It's a hard-working actor, as you can see from all the um, battle scars on the side. <laughs> uh, and we also have a smaller actor, too. This little coral trout model, which I attached to the seafloor using this. These guys love to hang out in coral reefs and eat smaller fishes. So we can use these models to experimentally and scientifically scare fishes. And we can quantify the trade-offs that fishes are making between being vigilant against these predators and doing important things like feeding. So we set up an experiment to do just that. We went to Coral Bay in Western Australia, where we get some of the world's biggest grazing halos. We put some delicious seaweed or algae inside the grazing halos. We pretty much set up a fish buffet. And we, <laughs> and we put these little algae buffets at increasing distances from that coral bummy in the center of that grazing halo. Then we chucked a model predator next to our little buffet. We set up some cameras to record what was going on, and then we just left it. And I'm going to show you what we found. So first up, we have what happens when there's no model present. This is just the algae. The fish swim in, and they get stuck into the algae. They're having a great time. It's a free-for-all. Now let's see what happens when we add our smaller coral trout model into the experiment. You can see the coral trout model bobbing up the top there. And the fish? The fish don't care at all. They're still just eating the algae and having a great time. That model coral trout isn't creating much fear. So what happens when we add a bigger model predator? What happens when we add the shark? The shark model's bobbing up there, and there's no fish around. That little stingray swims in, sees the shark, and goes, ooh, that's not where I want to be, and swims away again. It's a very different story. We actually did get a little bit of feeding in the presence of that model shark. It only happened when the algae was five meters away from the coral. And it took a long time to kick off. The fish weren't just swimming in and getting stuck into the algae. They were being a bit cautious and assessing the situation before they started to feed. And when we placed the algae at greater distances from that coral, about 15 to 30 meters, we got no feeding at all. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. Say you're a fish hanging out next to a coral bummy. You've got lots of places to hide, so you don't have to worry that much about passing predators. But if you swim out there onto the sand flat, you're completely exposed. It makes sense to be very cautious. And if there's a great big model shark out there, probably best not to bother at all. So it turns out that fish are expert risk assessors, just like my mum. She refuses to get in a car with me because she knows that I'm a terrible driver and my car's probably going to be a mess. <laughs> she assesses the risk and she changes her behavior accordingly. You guys probably do the same thing every day, and so do fish. So from our experiment, we found a really interesting trade-off that fish make between being cautious against this model shark and where they're willing to go to feed. And that trade-off is important because we know that in places where we don't have lots of sharks, we don't have many grazing halos. The fish just feed wherever they want. But in places where there are sharks, it might be that the sharks are changing where the fish are willing to go to feed, forming these grazing halos. And that might have unexpected outcomes at the bottom of the food chain. Because where we get these grazing halos, we get very dense patches of algae just outside those grazing halos. And those dense patches of algae can store a lot of carbon. We also might have benefits for corals, because there's only so much space on the seafloor, and algae and coral are in constant competition for that space. Because algae grows a little bit faster than coral, it tends to win that competition, and that's an issue after we get disturbances. But where we get these grazing halos, we get those clear patches of sand around the coral. It gives coral some breathing space, and some time to grow. So what this all means is that predators play important but sometimes surprising roles in coral reefs. We need predators in these systems not to just predate, 
but to actively create fear in these systems for them to work properly. Now, we're not quite sure how this fear works in every single context, but we're plugging those knowledge gaps by some of the fantastic research being done here in Western Australia and beyond. But we're facing an issue. That issue is that fishing are removing predators like sharks before we fully understand their roles in these systems. To really understand how important sharks are, we need to do more research. But because of the relentless decline of predator populations throughout our world's oceans, we're running out of time to do it. And that's what really drives us towards our goal of filling these knowledge gaps and finding important information to inform conservation of sharks and their important roles in coral reefs. So I'm going to ask you one more time. Is that a scary shark? Well, for some fish, that is a very scary shark, and that's important. So the next time you're swimming over a beautiful coral reef and you're admiring the general serenity, just remember that for some fish, that same beautiful coral reef is a hellscape of fear. <laughs> and that's a good thing. Thank you. <laughs>